Good morning. Today's reading is from Matthew 24. The destruction of the temple and the signs of the end times. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. Truly I tell you. <clears throat> Sorry, the phone has just gone off. Just putting it back on. Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that none of you are alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nation and kingdoms against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you'll be handed over to the prosecuted and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Amen. Wonderfully read. Thank you very much. And um, while I was saying that, uh, that the Bible is all about the future, it's all about prophecy, isn't it? And, and here we have it again, Matthew chapter 24. We've got Jesus telling the future, actually telling the disciples who asked a load of questions, three questions. He's actually telling them the future that is to come. So their future at some point will become one generation's present and at some point will become history. It's amazing how the Bible is written. And uh, you might remember that passage because uh, Alan read uh, most of that passage to us last week. And I have to say, Sheila spoke to us last week a brilliant message a uh, profound message, uh, an informative message, uh, telling us to be prepared, to watch out for the Lord Jesus Christ, and to put Jesus first over all things. Yes, she said, to enjoy life, but to put Jesus first. And whatever was happening to Jesus and, and the sufferings that were going on and the persecutions, he still lived his life, he still went to a party, he still had fellowship with people despite everything that was going on around him. But his focus was on doing the will of his father. And he did it to the letter. So Sheila gave us a, a great message and uh, it really inspired me. And for a while I've been wanting to do something or to teach or to preach on uh, Matthew chapter 24. And since Sheila introduced that to us last week, well, I thought, why not follow on for the next couple of weeks? So I'm going to cover Matthew chapter 24 uh, over the next two weeks, two sermons. Today, verses 1 to 14. Next week, verses 15 to 35. So you could get prepared, folks. You could prepare yourself for next week's message by actually reading the Bible, researching it, seeing what you make of it, and then when I preach on it, you can correct me if I've got anything wrong. Amen? Amen. So today I want to talk about knowing the signs of the times from this chapter. God has always wanted his children, his people, to know what is going on around them and to know what will happen in earth's history. And uh, he wanted that for Israel, and he kept telling them what would happen if they didn't obey him. He kept on telling them that if they, if they follow false idols, then something's going to happen. And it did happen. And then they came back in repentance and they worshiped God, but they drifted away again, and it happened, and they came back, and there was a bit of a cycle. And so there's a lesson for us not to drift away, to keep our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus, and whatever the troubles or the temptations of life is to stay in the faith, stay in church, stay in fellowship, and actually stay worshiping and having Jesus as our focus. 
Jesus did not want his disciples to be ignorant of the things that are to come. Matthew chapter 24 is known as an apocalyptic chapter. Um, apocalyptic means kind of, you know, looking, looking at all the future things that are going to happen in the end times. And uh, most of you will know that the book of Revelation is an apocalyptic book, but also so is the book of Daniel. Daniel and Revelation kind of go together as apocalyptic books. And Jesus spoke into the future history in the end times and of the final end time to come. And Matthew chapter 24, for me, falls naturally into two parts. Jesus, as we heard read, is speaking about the present temple in his generation that he and the disciples are looking at. But then Jesus goes on to unpack in the rest of chapter 24. He talks about things that happened in the past temple, which will happen again in the future temple. So Jesus is talking about three temples in Matthew chapter 24. But most people, if you just read it, you, you wouldn't know that because he only talks about really one temple by the name temple or this building. So you go away, read chapter 24, and see if you can piece together what Jesus is talking about, and I'll tell you next week. But again, if I've got it wrong, next week you can come and let me know. Amen? This is to encourage you. You know, I like a little bit of competition to have a look at the Bible, to read it for yourself, and then to see whether you come to the same conclusion that I do next week. So we're going to be looking at the future or the second half of Matthew 24 next week. But to give you context, Jesus is talking about three major events or signs that have happened in Israel and to the temple of God in Matthew 24. The first happened um, in Israel's past history in the Old Testament before Jesus was born. See if you can work out what that is. I'll tell you in a minute. The second happened in AD 70, a few decades after Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven. And the third will happen in Israel's and therefore our future history or our future. Given how things are happening at the moment in the world, the things that Jesus spoke about might not be so far away in the future. Now, the temple of God in Jerusalem has always been the most important building to the Jews, and I'm sure you know that. Yes, am I seeing any nodding heads? The temple in Jerusalem has always been the most important building to the Jews because it was the place of worship. God was said to dwell in the Holy of Holies. The temple was the center of the whole nation and the center of Jewish worship. The temple has always been a hot spot in Jerusalem. And Israel has always been the hot spot in the entire world throughout its whole history. To give context to the passage, Jesus is talking about three Jewish temples and the significant events that have or will affect those temples. And it is very relevant for us as we will see. So the three temples are on our screen. Solomon's temple, that is the original temple, the first physical temple. It was destroyed by the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar II in 587 BC. And then we have the second temple that was started under Zerubbabel, under Cyrus the Great, a name to remember. It's the time of Nehemiah and Ezra, the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, the, the rebuilding of the temple, and the great dedication of the second temple. It is known as the second temple. But it took quite a long time. They were always doing something to the temple over the 500 years. And in Jesus' day, it became known as Herod's temple. Because in Jesus' day, that 
beautiful building, Herod had done extensive extensions. Like you might do to your house, Herod extended the temple in Jerusalem. And in Jesus' day, it was known as the second temple, Herod's temple. But when we read the rest of Matthew 24, which I'll be going into next week, there is a third temple Hunt for it, search it out, research it. It is the temple that is to come. It's often called Ezekiel's temple because, as I've said, the whole Bible speaks about the future and the future becomes the present. And Ezekiel spoke and saw this third temple, which is yet to come. It is not here yet. But how soon is it coming? Everything is prepared in Israel to actually build the temple. All the temple artifacts are there. And a, a few years ago, well, actually probably 20 years ago, there was a, a great kerfuffle in the whole of Israel, and it hit Christianity because a red heifer without blemish was born in Israel. And if you know anything about the Bible to dedicate the temple, there has to be a perfect sacrifice of a red heifer without blemish to sprinkle and lay in the foundations of the temple. So when that red heifer was born, Christians went a bit wild. Oh my goodness, the third temple is going to start being built. And then all, all the human prophets started saying, oh, it's coming soon. This is going to happen. But Jesus has given us some good keys and to keep us sensible so that we don't follow the deceptions of prophecy which so many people are throwing out in the world. He wanted us to be grounded and he wanted us to know and to watch out for key certain signs of the times. Some of them in today's sermon are very general. But next week, see if you can spot the specific signs that we should be watching out for because when those signs start to happen, and I've actually told you this before, that's when, that's when I start to sweat a little bit. That's when I start to think, hmm, yeah, this is really, really happening now in my generation. But up until the present, there is a lot still to come. So we'll be looking at that next week. So today I want to deal, even though we're going to look at the three temples, I want to deal with the most straightforward temple from Matthew 24, 1 to 14. The one that the, the disciples were looking at and Jesus was looking at in his day, in his generation, and that is the second temple known as Herod's temple. It's the temple that started this whole apocalyptic discussion, um, and uh, we'll look at what this temple was about and what happened to it. You see, Jesus is leaving the temple. They've been there to worship. He was always going to and fro from the temple with his disciples. He is leaving the temple with his disciples. And the disciples come up to him and they call his attention to the majesty of this earthly temple and all of its buildings. If you've got your Bible open, that is in verse 1. And when they said, consider all these, these buildings, Jesus then is prompted to speak about that temple in his generation, the one that they are looking at. And he replied to his disciples in verse 2, Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Every stone of that temple will be thrown down. Wow. Wowzers, I guess the disciples thought. They seem to have gone very quiet because they were walking with Jesus out of the temple. They were walking out of Jerusalem together and they were going about two kilometers away, which would take about half an hour's walk to the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives is a fantastic place, a very significant place, as you know. Uh, Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives. Jesus is coming back to the Mount of Olives. Jesus was around the Mount of Olives when he was betrayed, and they came and they captured him. So the Mount of Olives is very important, and the disciples are very quiet. They've had half an hour to think about what Jesus said. And they sit on the Mount of Olives, and if you've ever been to Israel or seen the pictures, the Mount of Olives literally looks, literally looks over at the, the whole 
so-called Temple Mount and where the Dome of the Rock is now. It looks over the city of David. Uh, it, it, it's a panoramic view. And they were sitting looking at uh, the temple and uh, the disciples plucked up the courage and they said to Jesus, okay, you said something half an hour ago. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? These are three great questions, relevant then and very relevant to us today because one, there's only two questions left actually out of the three, one has already happened. The first question they asked was when? When will this temple that they are looking at in Jerusalem, Herod's temple, when will the second temple be destroyed? When will every stone of that temple be thrown down so that not one stone is left upon another? The second question was this, what? What is the sign of Jesus' second coming to rule in his kingdom, the millennial kingdom reign? And the third question, again, was a when? When will this whole world end? When will the judgment of God come? And when will the new heaven and the new earth begin? We're going to answer questions two and three next week. So I hope I've, I've got your attention and I hope you're going to go and read it. Jesus said in verse 2, Do you see these things? He said, Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And of course, the temple of God had suffered throughout Israel's history. But Jesus said, The time is coming again to utterly destroy this temple. And why was Herod's temple destroyed? Why is there no temple in Jerusalem at the moment? Why, for the last 2,000 years, has there been no place for Israel to worship, no place for sacrifices? Why? Well, I believe the reason is, is that God, at this point in history, does not want a temple in Jerusalem, a physical temple because Jesus Christ is the temple of God. Jesus is the physical living temple of God in whom God dwells, amen? amen? And so there's no need for sacrifice. There's no need for a demonstration to the world that you need a savior because the savior has come and in history, Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. He is the perfect sacrifice, and it's happened. There were observers inside the Bible written in detail and also outside of the Bible. And I've uh, uh, just picked up in the news recently that somewhere in Israel, they've just found an inscription, Jesus, son of Mary. They don't mention his father because God is his father. The Bible is the most verifiable book of history in the world. And as the future becomes history and it's verified, I have 100% confidence that everything that is going to come will happen at God's appointed time. And he has chosen to share certain key signs to us and for us so that we know to be prepared so that we know the time is short, so that we know to get our priorities right, so that we know that when persecution comes to you and me, of which I believe every Christian is experiencing today, I certainly have experienced persecution for being a Christian, that we need to be strong and keep our focus. So the temple of God has suffered. There's no temple because Jesus is the temple. And Jesus speaks about this temple. And this temple, well, Solomon is known as, the first temple was known as Solomon's temple. He was the man of peace and he built the first fixed temple. So a little bit of history about these three temples, at least Solomon's temple and Herod's. The very first temple was Solomon's temple. It was destroyed during the siege of Jerusalem by Neb. 
Nebuchadnezzar II, of the Neo-Babylonian Empire in 587 BCE. How do we know this? It is extremely well recorded in history. You cannot wipe out true history. God will not allow true history to be wiped out, although many might deny it. Solomon's temple being destroyed. Israel, as you know, because God had told them, you, you, you don't deserve to live here. You're worshipping this and you're worshipping that. You're doing all these things, living in your sin. God told them that a nation would come and they'd be carted off for 70 years. God told them their future. And there's a generation which became their future because Israel spent 70 years captive in Babylon. You will know Psalm 137.1. By the rivers of Babylon, we, we sat down and we remembered Zion, blah, 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 blah. I still, still, that's my, that's my audition again for the worship team. <coughs> and, and you see, this, this first temple, God allowed it to be destroyed, for Jerusalem to be destroyed, for the people to be carted off for 70 fallow years. The land needed to rest for the abuse that had happened. And so they are gone for a whole 70 years. It's the time of the prophet Daniel. The time of Daniel. He was one of those taken away and he writes his apocalyptic book, the book of Daniel, whilst he is there, held captive in Babylon. And Daniel links to the book of Revelation. Now, the savior of Israel, God always has a savior somewhere. Moses was one of them, led his people out. King David is another one. Samson in the Old Testament, the judges were saviors of Israel. But the savior of Israel at this time, Israel captured in Babylon, the savior was Cyrus the Great. So 70 years at the end of this exile, Cyrus the Great was the founder, the Achaemenid, let's just say Persian Empire. Cyrus was a Persian, and Cyrus was God's instrument. God raised him up, and he achieved remarkable conquest during his reign. He, it included the capture of Babylon and the defeat of the Assyrian Empire. And remember, whilst, whilst Daniel is writing, he has his vision that, that he'd already given to Neb, Euchanezer, the vision of the, of, of the big man with the golden head and there's silver and there's bronze and there's clay. And the vision was the empires that were to come. And he maps out the empires that will come and there is a final empire represented by the ten toes of iron mixed with clay, which is very, very weak. Very, very weak. And Christians, if you know your history, all the empires except the last one has happened. It's now Earth's history. Daniel got it right. And uh, the big one was the Roman Empire that he spoke about, the one that Jesus is born into, the Messiah, who hung him on a cross. But there's the last empire to come, and it's perhaps even starting, well, it is starting, to come about. It would only need a, a global catastrophe, I believe, a global catastrophe to shake all the world governments to say, we've got to work together, we can't have this ever again. And the way the world is shaping up, I'm little concerned about some of the things the politicians are saying that might be coming down the track. The world could be talking itself into the danger zone. But we do not worry, we do not fear, because we know what is going to happen. However grisly it is, whether we live as Christians or we die 
As long as we die as Christians, we have eternal life. The flesh, what is that worth? Yes, there's suffering and there's pain, and let's face it, none of us want to go through that. But it is going to come. But the soul, as Helena said, the spirit, that is the bit that's eternal. That's the bit that we need to keep faith, eyes on Jesus, so that we have our reward, eternal life in heaven. In heaven. So Cyrus was God's instrument, and he is most famous in history for setting Israel free to return to their land and to rebuild uh, the temple. In Isaiah chapter 44, God even calls Cyrus, remember, he's not Jewish, he is a Persian. God calls Cyrus his anointed one. In Isaiah uh, 45, the next chapter, God calls Cyrus God's shepherd, the shepherd of his people. And these are significant titles which you and I know are exclusively for the Lord Jesus Christ. So aligning Cyrus as a savior, a type of Jesus Christ, that's how much God really liked Cyrus. Cyrus was Persian. He united the peoples of which country? Modern day Iran. Modern day Iran. Iran, the Iranians, the Persians were once great friends of Israel, great friends of God Almighty. And Cyrus united modern day Iran and Still within in Iran, there are many, many people from descent from Cyrus's time, Persians. Lots of different people groups in Iran. It's not homogeneous. They're not all thinking the same. There's an evil regime, yes, but amazing things are happening, happening in Iran. In 1979 was the Islamic revolution in Iran, where Iran was taken over by Shia Islam, and there have been tensions in the country ever since. In fact, Christianity is growing very rapidly in Iran. It is estimated there's more than a million born-again Christians in Iran. In fact, many observers state that Christianity is growing at its fastest rate in Iran and also along with China. Persecution, unfair dictatorial regimes calls people to seek for God. And if you seek for God, you will find him. But let's go back to that second temple. Let's go back to the temple that the disciples and Jesus were looking at, to Herod's temple. Jesus and the disciples looked at it from the Mount of Olives, and it was destroyed, as Jesus said there is a massive event that happened in A.D. 70. The Romans, who had ruled there for hundreds of years, in A.D. 70, they came in like a whirlwind. They came in like a fire. They came in like a great tribulation, and they destroyed the whole of Jerusalem, and they flattened the temple. You see, the Romans had got fed up with the stiff-necked Jews, because they were always after seeking God, rightly or wrongly, but they were always making skirmishes in the region. They were a thorn in Romans' side, and so the Romans had enough. They destroyed the temple, and they actually did take that temple down, stone by stone by stone, so that not one stone was left on top of another. Recorded facts in history and observed by historians at the time. You see, the reason why they took it down that way is that temple was incredible. They, they didn't plaster the walls with plaster. They overlaid it with gold. <laughs> And the gold went into the cracks of the stones. So to get all the gold out, you took the stone down one by one and you gathered all the precious metal. And Jesus knew and he told his disciples. And that was a big sign for their times. 
Jesus, while he was crucified around AD 33, he lived for 33 and a half years. So within 40 years of Jesus' ascension, Jesus' prophecy about the second temple happened in history. That happened pretty darn quick. That was a, a quick happening, wasn't it? And, uh, and I guess some of them thought it was the end time, because in that one generation, they were, the disciples are still alive. Wow, this happens to Jerusalem. Great tribulation. Maybe now the kingdom has come. But actually, no, not yet. So the temple is destroyed. There is nothing left. Not one stone was left upon another. The Romans expelled the Jews from Israel. And in AD 70, the great diaspora happened. The great expelling or dispersal of the Jews into the many nations of the world. This is the known world at the time, how the diaspora actually started and how it happened. But of course, the world is a big place. And Jewish people have gone to most nations in the world. Probably not the really cold ones. But actually, probably yes, they did. So the Romans expel the Jews, the temple is gone, the people have gone, but, but, God in Ezekiel 36, hundreds of years before this event, God had been mapping out the future that is to come. And so God promised in Ezekiel 36 that he would bring the nation of Israel back to the land of Israel again. That he would call his people from all four corners back to their homeland. And this happened in 1948, as Sheila explained last week. And I've done teaching on this as well. Do you remember Sheila spoke about how, how can a nation be born in a day? Well, it was born in a day. It was born in a day. And the background to the United Nations of that time was to have a two-state solution. That was the whole plan. To have a Palestine and have an Israel. Israel says, yes, that's fine. Have what you want. We'll take all the, the rubbish desert stuff, which they've turned into milk and honey. But what happened? They were supposed to declare the state of Israel and the state of Palestine. Israel declares the state of Israel, and then we get war. We get war. An opportunity missed. Or perhaps God knows. Perhaps God knows and has written down what will be to come. And God brought his people back, not because of them. God brought his people back for his name's sake for my namesake, for my honor, for my reputation, I bring you back to the land and to the nation. So here endeth this great dispersal that began in uh, AD 70. In 1948, the Jews started going back into the land. But God had also said in his Bible, also written down in the future, that Israel's return would be in two parts. It would happen in two ways. In Ezekiel 37, God promised that he would turn Israel to himself, that God would give them a new heart. He would write his laws on their minds. He would be their God. He, they will be his people. Ezekiel 36 and 37 is about Israel. So the return of Israel from the diaspora is in two parts. Number one, sinful, normal human beings who are Jews back to the land to set up the nation. But part two, a future event, part two, a future event to come, Israel will see God, they will turn to God, and they will see Jesus as their Messiah, and they will respond with repentance and in faith. This current conflict is causing the nation of Israel to turn to Yahweh. Yahweh is our God, but there will come a time when they turn 
to their Messiah, who is our God, Jesus Christ the Lord. The nation comes first with all its troubles. They're not perfect. Of course, they're not perfect, and the same rules apply. But there's coming a time that will come when God will put his spirit, he will change their heart, and they will have a massive impact in the future of this world. But I think that the world will never be the same again after all of these current conflicts. I, I think that this two-state solution is probably over now. I think Israel is going to turn its back on it. Enough is enough. Seven times we agreed it. Seven times it's turned down. I have a feeling that the nation will say, is there going to be a different way? That will have a massive impact, a massive impact. And that could tumble this world into a whole series of things over the next couple of years. You see, surrounding Herod's temple's destruction in Matthew 24, Jesus gives a list of things that will happen in the build-up to his second coming. These things, some have happened, some are happening, and next week there is a lot that will happen. But Jesus said in our passage today, the end is not yet. The second half of Matthew 24 must happen first. There are major signs to come, look them up, that have not yet happened, but I'm starting to perceive they could happen, they could start fairly quickly. I'm sure when Jesus spoke to the disciples, the disciples were thinking, well, when's the temple going to come down then? Oh, we've all, we, we waited 2,000 for Jesus to come. Well, maybe it's 1,000 years. But actually, it wasn't. It was 40 years. It happened really quickly in Jesus' day. And that's the subject of next week. So what are the signs? I'm going to go through them really quickly. You can imagine what they are. You see them anyway, but I'm just going to go through them. The signs of the times building up to the end time. Sheila mentioned some of these. As I go through them, how many do you think are happening now? So verse 4, deception. Sheila warned us, do not be deceived. Many deceptions happening, particularly in the church today. Many are saying that they are the Christ. Well, in history, I looked up. How many, how many people said they were Christ? Well, it's, it's over a thousand. In, in the history, I mean, uh, there were far too many to name, but you might have heard of uh, the Moonies. Well, the founder of the Moonies, he said he was Jesus Christ incarnate. Even the Shakers, she said that she was Jesus Christ incarnate as a woman. Verse 6, there will be wars and rumors of wars. Well, that's all around us at the moment. And wars are plural. There will be many wars. There will be many rumors of wars. In fact, the Geneva Academy, which is an institution that looks at human rights around the world, they currently list 110 so-called conflicts or wars in the world today. 110. Yeah, we know about Ukraine. We know about Israel. But do we know about all the others that are going on where our brothers and sisters are being murdered, Christians are being expelled from nations, they're being dispersed, kicked out, murdered, driven out. It's happening, and it's happening all around us. Verse 7, nation rising against nation and kingdom rising against kingdom. What's the difference? The first difference is it's singular. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. A time period will exist over the earth where one nation and one kingdom will be in contention with another nation and another kingdom. I believe there will be a one world government, a one world religion or kingdom, but God's kingdom the kingdom of God will rise up in contention to that kingdom. In fact, Daniel showed that when a stone comes and smashes the feet of the giant and it all tumbles apart. These are things that are to come. Verse 7b, famines and earthquakes. Well, there's quite a few earthquakes at the moment. In fact, I didn't even realize we're having earthquakes in Scotland in, in the UK, there are earthquakes happening, quite big ones. But there's been a lot in Japan. Iceland's got volcanoes going off. 
This is not the end. These are the birth pangs in verse 8. The contractions that Sheila spoke about, they start and then they speed up as the baby is coming. And I have to tell you, given my bad back and my bad hip, I reckon I know what giving birth is like. <laughs> I thought we needed a bit of a joke, because this is heavy stuff. <laughs> Just five minutes to go, folks, and we'll be there. I empathize with you ladies who are given birth. Don't hit me over coffee. In verse 9, it says, Jews and Christians will be hated by all nations. The Saturday people will be hated. They've always been hated. The Saturday people, because Jews worship on Saturday. And it will spill over to the Sunday people, who are the Christians who worship on Sunday. They will be hated. We will be hated by all nations. There is so much in the diversity agenda, so much that is going on, in the Western world that is so against the principles, the values of God, against his, um, his ethics, that when we stand up for what's in the Bible, we will be hated for it, we will be vilified for it, and we will even be brutalized for it. That is coming. Christianity will become very unpopular. Societies, peoples, and nations will turn against us. As Jesus says, Christians will be martyred. It's happening now. Ethnic cleansing of Christians is happening in Nigeria. The top half of Nigeria is already Islam. And as Islam moves south, they are forcing villages to turn to Islam or to have your head chopped off. Nigeria is going to become and will be Islamic. The map is about to change. 51% of the population in Nigeria is already Muslim. That means the force for Sharia law is already happening. And that is why it's falling. And it's our brothers and our sisters who are paying the price. These things are happening and they are increasing. Verse 10, due to the increasing hostile environment that we're all going to be in, we might escape, but it is coming. It is coming, and it's coming fast. Many Christians will turn away from the faith. They will lose their faith. Their love will go cold. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many. That's happening. Avoid the Passion Translation Bible, for example. Verse 12, as the overall wickedness increases in the world, and the way I call that, it will be this. The world will say, what actually is wrong in the Bible is right. What is right in the Bible is wrong. Each person will go their own way and make up their own rules. Even as Christians, I'll make up my own God in my own image to suit my lifestyle. No, the Bible is the plumb line of God, and the Bible has a lot to speak into those attitudes. But it is coming. As wickedness increases, then the love of many goes cold. It's a big list. How many of that list can you see happening? Quite a few, I think. Now, you know me, I tend to end sermons pretty quickly. So the quick ending is now on its way. Marcia? Team, get yourselves ready to come for our last verse. Go home and read Matthew 24, but make sure you try to study 15 to 35 for next week. It seems to me these things have always been here. They have always been here, but it seems that in some ways it's growing in intensity. When you look at world maps and you look how nations are aligning, aligning it seems to be growing and happening like those birth pangs are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. But the end is still not yet. Jesus tells us two things at the end of this section. Verse 13, he gives us some good advice. He says this, the Christian, the believer, who stands firm to the end will be saved. Amen. But the warning is, the Christian who fades away 
won't be saved. I, mean, I, I, I do not believe once saved, all saved. And I think Jesus is saying, he's telling us, Christians, believers in Jesus Christ, it will get hotter and hotter and hotter. Someone in, in, in maybe 100 years or in 10 years might see this on YouTube. Christians, it's going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. The temptation to run away, to deny your faith, the temptation to, to hide away is going to become great. But Jesus says, the believer, the Christian who stands firm to the end will be saved. Whatever happens, stand firm. I remind you, death, torture, beheading cannot touch us. Verbal persecution cannot touch us. It all hurts. It's all destructive. It's all evil. But it cannot destroy soul and spirit. Stay in the faith. Stay firm. Jesus is coming, and you will get a crown. Amen. The second thing Jesus says is this. Despite the persecution of the Jews, despite the persecution of the Christians being expelled from most Muslim countries at the moment, Nigeria falling, as I've already said, despite everything that's against the Jewish nation and people, everything that's against Christianity and the message of the gospel, Jesus tells us this. Despite all this persecution, the true gospel message of Jesus Christ will be preached in the whole world to every nation and people ethnicity. And it will be preached to every ethnic group of people as a testimony to the truth of God. Every nation, ethnic group, some will have the gospel and it's down to them to spread it. But as soon as it hits one person, two people in the ethnicity, it's done. Then the gospel has hit those groups. And it's a testimony so that all nations will be without excuse. Do you know Christianity is a Middle Eastern religion? It's not a Western religion. That's one of the biggest lies that Satan's actually put into the world. Oh, Christianity is Western. Look at the Westerners. They're decadent. They're rich. They're not spiritual. They murder each other. They get drunk on alcohol. They do all these orgy things. Look at, look at them. Christianity is a Middle Eastern religion right in the center of the earth because it was to go out to all four corners. We need to, in a way, reclaim the Middle Easternness of our faith. Amen? Well, I think so. Whew. Right, last slide. Hallelujah. I tell you what, I need a cup of coffee. After. Who needs a coffee? Who needs a coffee, yeah? Who's going to watch this video again to get the most out of it? So look, it doesn't take much to show that the world is hotting up. I agree with Sheila, the birth pangs are increasing, and by definition, they have been increasing ever since Jesus died on the cross. The birth pangs have been increasing. We must pray for Jerusalem. We are commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We look to Jesus. We must look to Jesus. We must look to the new Jerusalem, the kingdom that is to come. Amen? Amen. So next week, we're going to look at a couple of key signs. This temple going was a massive sign in AD 70. It's come true. So Jesus speaks about these other two temples, and he speaks about what will happen in the future, our future now, future history. It will come true. And we need to keep our eyes open to watch for those specific times. I've said before, when I see those specific times, whoo, you won't be, I won't have an argument by saying, well, he's coming back in 100 years, or I think Sheila mentioned some people might even think 2,000 years. When I see these keys happening, I'll go, the end is now. It's now. It's happening. So that will be our um, sermon for next week. Read Matthew chapter 24 as homework. May the Lord bless you. May his face shine upon you. And may he make that coffee taste even nicer than normal. Amen. Amen.